I, um, I want to uh, begin by um, just uh, some speculation about what the panel is, uh, which is uh, voices from around the world. Uh, I'm just remembering a poem by uh, Frank O'Hara where um, he's, uh, it's actually the late lady, lady died, it's a very New York poem, where uh, the line that sort of most people would remember Frank O'Hara being shocked at the end and so on. But the line that struck me, uh, that stayed with me, is that he's going to meet uh, Leroy Jones and they're going to check out what the poets of Ghana are doing these days. Uh, which I wonder, wonder what Frank O'Hara was, was thinking when he wrote that, what, what that meant. Um, and I think we're, so I want us to be skeptical about our about curiosity or curious about our curiosity. Uh, we uh, come from a history of an uh, isolationist uh, country, a country that uh, also believes in its exceptionalism, and I think the two are tied. Uh, and so that's, that's what part of our history. We're also, we, we are a nation of nations, which that could mean that we're satisfied with our diversity within, not that that diversity has ever really meant equality. Uh, but there's a, there's a kind of enclosure. There's also a tradition of looking outward, um, <clears throat> uh, even after the worst episode, not the worst, but one of the episodes of American isolationism, World War I, when we did join and Wilson came and wanted to reshape the world with the League of Nations and the 19-point plan and so on. So I think we're, we're uh, sort of a country that uh, has its ups and downs about its interest in the world. And um, I wanted us to sort of wonder why we're interested in poets uh, around the world. Um, to that end, I want to also say it's very difficult to know what the world the poets uh, around the world are doing. Poetry, as uh, I think Eliot had said, is one of the most nationalistic uh, of all the arts. Uh, a lot of the debates happen in a, within a linguistic, a limited linguistic uh, context. Um, the poets that are writing are following uh, different forefathers, but essentially, if you will, the poet is the best poet in Catalonia maybe doesn't really want to become better than Eliot. He wants to become better, if you will, than the, the most senior poet in that language. So language creates a certain kind of naturalistic bubble, which is very hard to, to, um, to break into. Much of the current debates in any language are not really accessible in translation. We get, translation is a, a delayed action. Uh, I mean, some poems get translated very quickly, but I don't know what the average of when a poem gets translated. It, I would imagine it's maybe 10 years. Some poets get translated 40 or 50 years later. The debates uh, are not easy to, uh, <coughs> to find, but we can create an artificial experiment and try to find what's happening, which is what I've done. I had no idea how to find out what's happening in the rest of the world, so I reached out to my friends on Facebook. Uh, and I reached out to, the <laughs> to many, uh, actually I wrote a questionnaire, and I sent it to about 30 Arab poets. Uh, and I asked them, what are you writing today? Do you follow the news? Does it impact or influence your writing? What are you reading today? Have you been reading, rereading poetry? What has been the experience of rereading? Like I mentioned that uh, during a time of crisis, which is what the, a lot of the uh, Arab countries are experiencing, maybe there is a recalibration of whom you know you want to return to your origins, reading origins, and do, are you reassessing who you read and what you thought? And then finally, what um, did you notice changes in your work? What is drawing you to the new form that you're writing in? Uh, I got one of the first uh, responses I got was. Um, from a poet named Ashur Etwebi, he's a Libyan. Actually, the generosity of American poets helped uh, this poet who had has his house burned and uh, uh, by some militia uh, land a place asylum in Norway. So uh, this is not to say that the outreach of American poetry is it, it has a great impact. And in fact, a few letters from American poets were very impactful in helping this particular poet, who I think he's the finest poet in, in Libya and in, in the Arab world today. <clears throat> and he wrote a very lyrical answer, which, by the way, I have not translated. So I, if it sounds like the UN translator, uh, <laughs> it, it says me. 
So he says that to live in ruin, to live in the false anticipation, to live heroism and humiliation at the same time, to do and not do, to live raising your finger, uh, which has uh, where the, 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 the jewel is shining, uh, protruding and shining, to toss and turn on the burning embers of your disappointments, to discover that your life is but a piece of paper, a newspaper filled with news that are useless now. This is what passing through a historical juncture means to a people who do not know whether you belong to them or not. This is the passing through a historical juncture juncture where death and life are equated, high and low are equated, narrow and wide, head and tail, the follower and the followed, the, uh, the preacher and the atheist, the stationary and the moving, the virtuous and the virtueless. What are you writing now? <clears throat> he says, maybe it should be phrased differently. Uh, what is writing me now? The sound of the truth is quiet but the lie is resounding. Uh, which of them am I? Um, do I write? Or, or, or which of them am I? Am I writing them? Or which of them am I writing? Or are they writing me? Even the truth has not remained truth. It has, uh, but it has the smell and taste of alluring lies. But on a some second, on a second, second, the dust has to settle, as it said. And the eyes have to remove the dust and room that has gathered on them. Uh, and they must try to see the sun. So a very lyrical answer. What is he reading? Uh, he is reading uh, a lot of religious texts, <clears throat> trying to find out, uh, if you will, the roots of some of the uh, extremist ideology that's guiding a lot of the political action now. Um, at the same time, he's wondering, can you get poetry out of this reading? Where is the poetry to be found in, 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 this, uh, in these texts? Uh, also, I'm writing about Norway. <coughs> the country I'm living in now is a book called The Norwegian Poems. I was translating a good deal of Asian, European, and American, and African poetry, especially poetry of women. Um, even though he's reading uh, deeply into the theology or ideology of the extremists, he says uh, the great uh, topics, the great causes do not uh, attract me, do not allure me towards writing. Uh, he says I, I, I write to but elemental things. At the same time, uh, I am in need of a sieve to which uh, uh, filter out my mm. soul and my heart, a sieve uh, that I could filter out the earth and the sky uh, and, and save uh, all the creatures in the dust. You say an idea is a sister to another idea. They say a laughter is a sister, one laugh is a sister to another laugh. And they say that metaphor is a god. But oh, how heavy the soul is on the shoulders of the poet. Yes, please. Et Webby. E T W E B I at Twebi. Uh, he lives in a town called Etwebia. <laughs> in Norway? Etwebi, no, in Libya. Oh. I used to kid him and he say he lives in Utopia, but uh, he's in Norway now. Uh, Nujum Al Ghanem from the Emirates um, is a filmmaker. Uh, she um, she, says, she writes, uh, she's a filmmaker and a film critic. Essentially, she says, um, she's really conflicted about writing, and she says, I do not really feel like I've written anything when I do not write poetry. Uh, and she's not been able to write poetry. Uh, but she says that the writing of the poem has become a way of generating concepts or ideas. And that she, the poem comes, it becomes a, a sort of an intriguing sort of, uh, uh, there's a form of the poem where, even, even in, the, um, in the sonnet, where you have the, like the problem is introduced, and then the, the, in the eight lines, or the, the, and then you have the, the volta, and then the problem is resolved. So um, in essence, what she's saying is that the poem creates the, the problem, and then she never writes the 
six lines afterwards. She goes and makes a film out of the first eight lines. Mm. <laughs> um, dismayed uh, about what's happening, uh, is reading the novel. She loves the spirit of unfettered, uh, if you will, confession. She's reading uh, Basho, Isa, and Basson. Uh, St. John Purse and Rambo and Aragon from France. Charles Simic uh, is um, also one of her favorites. Uh, Mahmoud Darwish. And she's reading Sania Saleh, who's not a well known poet, Mahmoud Darwish and Adonis and Qasim Haddad. She's visiting, revisiting them because their poetry has shaped, um, is part of the history, of her history within modern poem source. She's uh, revisiting them. Um, uh, Rasha Omran is not able to write much poetry. She's uh, a Syrian poet living in between Paris and Cairo. Uh, she's reading um, a poet's uh, 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 work of friends. That's all she can sort of do. But the book that she says she's come back to uh, again and again is, and I don't know the name of English or French, but uh, Aragon, the French poet Aragon, uh, uh, Mad Alza's Madman, Madman of Alza. It's a poem set in Granada. Uh, she's uh, there's actually a long history of association between Andalusian or Moorish Spain and and. Uh, and Syria, because the same dynasty that had uh, ruled Syria from like the seventh to the eighth century uh, it relocated was the Moorish um, uh, Arab uh, there, and so the, the writing about Granada to her is uh, a, a sort of she sees that as as Damascus, which is her lost paradise now. Uh, Faraj Abu Lesha from Libya. I don't know how much time have I gone? Maybe two. Faraj Abu Lesha from Libya is writing uh, a lot of uh, particular um, uh, journalistic. Um, uh, he's writing about the emails of Hillary Clinton. Of course, there's a the, the tale of there's a. I actually looked up uh, one of the worst days of fighting in Benghazi. I looked up the New York Times, and there was nothing about what's happening in the city. It, it, there's a, there's a tale the tale of two Benghazis. One is the American Benghazi, which is all a Republican whatever, and then there's the city that uh, has been in civil war, does not get reported on. So he's trying to actually uh, take from the emails of, of Hillary Clinton how the, the US involvement at that time shaped the, the, the political conflict as it is now. Uh, he remembers uh, the days when he was a refugee in Germany. He worked at the Braun appliance and electronics factory, and he worked as a uh, uh, as a gardener in an elementary school, he says, I wasn't making a lot of money, but I wrote freely, and I'm trying to write with that spirit now. Uh, Ranal Tunsi, uh, Egyptian, there's so many. She actually says something very interesting. He says, uh, she believes in the poem more. I, I, I trust poetry more, that it has, uh, it brings uh, life to the sun, sunrise, as if life is at the, when you read a poem, you feel like life is at, at, its, at, at the sun, as if it's a, a new sunrise, that it opens a, a new attitude towards life. Uh, I felt reading the earlier poets, it is as if I'm a shadow for those who had passed before me, mm. that the fear I'm feeling or that I'm the shadow of those who had passed before me, that the fear I'm feeling is not mine alone. The good poem will always be new to the world. We must all hold on to the poem because it will lead us to some form of arrival. I trust poetry deeply. It is the only force that could save us from solitude and pain now. I'll stop here, but uh, there are many, many more poems. I hope to do something with this, but there are about 20 poets here, and uh, their answers are really nourishing. And, and uh, So uh, maybe there's a more. That would be an important article. I hope so, yeah. OK. Uh, Roberto Waros of Argentina. This is translated by Merwin. I think that in this moment, perhaps no one in the universe thinks about me that only I think of myself, and if I died now, nobody, not even I, would think about me. And here rises the abyss, as when I fall asleep. I am my own support, 
and I remove it. I help to wallpaper everything with absence. Perhaps for that reason, to think about a person means to save him. I've mm -hmm. thought about this poem countless times seeing the uh, pho photos of refugees fleeing through countries, from countries, drowning on beaches, at train stations, and how important it is um, that we continue to think about one another and speak up for one another in a way that is larger than often the political discourse. Um, you mentioned Charles Simic. Mm -hmm. I love a place where he said years ago, our big unspoken secret, he said this better, this is paraphrasing, our big unspoken secret is that we're really ignorant about what people are writing everywhere else. And we need to do more work and we need to do it all the time. We need to be curious. We need to keep seeking out uh, voices who, who really represent uh, the spirits of their country more than the information we get. Um, 30 years ago, a poet in Bangladesh said to me, we try so hard to read what people in your country are writing. Do people in your country try as hard to know what we write? I felt extremely ashamed. In a few words, not often enough, and not often enough about everybody, everywhere. Um, it did strike me on one of my two, three trips to Bangladesh that that was the only place I'd ever been in the world where a poetry reading could be organized at 2 p.m., uh, some posters tacked up on doorways, and 2,000 people would show up four hours later. Um, I just had never seen this kind of model for poetry hunger. In a globally connected society, dis this desperately complicated universe we're sharing, it seems our responsibility is to find these voices from everywhere who are reaching out to us. Galway Cannell said, to me, poetry is someone standing up, so to speak, and saying with as little concealment as possible what it is for him or her to be on earth at this moment. Um, and too often, the news we're given, the headlines we're given, feels more like concealment of too many perspectives. Um, Rolf Jakobson of Norway, a place I've never been, I've been reading his poems for decades though, so I feel as if I've been there. This is translated by Olav Grinde, wrote years ago, we are all children when we sleep. There's no war in us then. We open our hands and breathe in that calm rhythm heaven has given us. Some years ago, uh, this academy sponsored a poets exchange between poets of Mexico and the United States. Um, a few of us went to Mexico and gave readings here and there in different communities, and then they did the same. Small groups, both directions. How fascinating it was, even though I live very near the border of Mexico in a 63% Latino city, to meet all these Mexican poets and hear them describing their deepest inspiration as being European surrealist poetry. We feel no connection, they said, to Mexican-American poets who like to write about family, heritage, and tradition. We are surrounded by our families, they said. <laughs> poetry is the one place we can get away from them. <laughs> We are not hearkening back, reaching to the ground of our own being, our ethnic legacies. We are reaching out for liberation. Um, it changed my life to meet this group of poets. Many of us have stayed in touch to this day. Um, Shireen Ibadi, a, a, a wonderful activist, advocate for uh, human rights from Iran, uh, came to, I think she was the first Iranian woman to win the Nobel Prize, I believe. The only one. The only, yeah. right. Um, she came to San Antonio some, some years ago and uh, gave an amazing lecture and uh, she had gotten an old family friend to come and translate and um, her lecture because she was, um, did not feel comfortable speaking in English and um, I remember that he was asked at the dinner before the event, um, do you do this often? He said, no, I've never done this in my life. I run a car dealership. I'm in, ta I'm in, a, I'm in a state of terror. <laughs> and he gave a beautiful, beautiful translation and, uh, of which she approved and loved. And she said, whenever there are two countries in conflict, potential conflict or breaking news conflict, this is the time we need more than ever to share our real human stories our recipes, our food, our music, our poetry. And she emphasized poetry saying uh, that because of its brevity and because of its you know, easier transmission process than like reading whole Iranian novels if you're living in some 
remote place in the United States and you can't find all the books you might like to have at your fingertips, uh, that poetry was one of the best ways that we could be connected. Um, shortly after that, um, I went to visit Ashland, Oregon, and they had heard some quotes from her talk that were presented on public radio that had been transmitted. And so their teachers had allowed them to do all of their poetry project relating to Iranian poets instead of American, which they had always done before. And the teacher said they had never been more enthusiastic. They were in love with these poets. And they gave a reading in their school only of contemporary Iranian poetry in mm. translation. They said, actually, these are not only the first positive thoughts we've ever had a chance to have about Iran, uh, but we feel our lives have been changed in terms of how we'll look at news ever after. And we also like poetry better than we ever have before. So there was a great gusto there at the public high school of Ashland, Oregon, um, with this sense of opening up, something opening up when you focus and when you research and when you pull the voices into your own community. Um, I've been moved in recent years, I should ask you, Toy, about this place, by the Conflict Kitchen in Pittsburgh. I've never been there. But this place, which is a little restaurant in a park, serves food only from countries with which the United States is in conflict. <laughs> um, so they have served a lot of Iranian food, Iraqi food, Palestinian food, um, and uh, North Korean food, which they describe on their website as being distinctly different from South Co other Korean food. Yep. And right now they're serving uh, Cuban food. Mm. You should really look at the Al Jazeera story online about the conflict kitchen. It will inspire you. Um, it's a gorgeous model. One man is interviewed as he's finishing his meal and he says, food is delicious, conflict is sad. Mm. And that's his entire comment. And I think that to uh, bring poetry into our classrooms or whatever settings we're in in our lives that, that come from uh, these places we're hearing about in other sadder ways, I love that quote about needing a sieve, mm -hmm. um, is one of the best things we, uh, lovers of poetry, can do for the people we know. And of course, we might be inclined to pull in poetry from the places we know best, where we've traveled ourselves, but, uh, but it could be from any place. Uh, about which we're not an expert, but but we appreciate uh, the voices from there. Um, I am, as a San Antonian, uh, a huge basketball fan, and uh, I have to quote from the Spurs coach, Greg Popovich, we have two new Spurs this year who happen to be American. We have had the most international team, um, in I think, of all American basketball teams. And so, uh, Greg Popovich, our coach, was just asked, how are you creating, creating camaraderie with these two new stars who are American and all the other players are not American? How are, you, how are you doing it? How are you getting everybody to know each other and play together well before the season starts? And he said, we, this is just a few days ago, we all know that if you know someone better, it's hard to be angry or hate them. Most hate comes out of fear or ignorance, so the more familiar players are with one another, the more likely they are to get along. Then he was asked the very stupid question, so how do you help build that kinship among the Spurs? He said, obviously we make baskets, we weave. <laughs> we sew and we knit. Um, but I thought that's a great model, and it reminded me of Selma Khadra Jayusi, a great a scholar of Arabic literature uh, who has published many books, many anthologies of Arabic literature from all countries through Columbia University Press here over a 30-year period. And she said in introductions to her books, um, if we know one another, we may be less likely to kill one another. Mm -hmm. um, none of this helps me understand Syria in any way. Uh, I also recommend the series which exist at different presses in the United States, like uh, Trinity University Press, also in San Antonio where I live, has had for some years now the Writer's World series. This is the uh, book Mexican Writers on Writing. Uh, the next book will be a volume of Swedish writers edited by 
Malena Morling, uh, Edward Hirsch, has, uh, previous chancellor, has been the over, overall editor of this series. Mm -hmm. And it's a great series to pick up because if you don't know that much about Polish writing or you feel like you need you know, more names, more, m more sustenance, uh, just go to a series of this kind, The Writer's World, Trinity University Press, and, and get uh, some of their books. So who should we be reading? Everyone should read All the People Khalid Translates. Um, <laughs> Saadi Youssef has been an extremely important uh, poet uh, to me in recent years. And I think that uh, he's very popular among students of all ages. High school students love him. His book, You, uh, you Translated Without an Alphabet, Without a Face, mm -hmm. is a very popular and important book. I think it won the Penn Prize, didn't it? Yes. The Penn Translation Award. And, uh, uh, and, it, and it, it's popular everywhere. Everybody loves that book. Um, Arthur Z, our third panelist who could not be here today, says he specially wanted to recommend everyone to the work of a Dutch poet mm -hmm. whom he is translating K. Period Michel, M-I-C-H-E-L. And uh, his poems are starting to be published in en English, and as well as Wang Jian, or Jishin, J I A X I N, Wan Jan. He would like people to read that poet and Mimi Ye, Y E, from Taiwan. Uh, these are the, his three favorite poets from elsewhere he has been reading this year. Uh, working in China this year and talking to a lot of young people, uh, they were very surprised and enthusiastic to talk about contemporary poetry because they said in their schools they're so often given ancient poetry and older poetry that they felt happy to hear about uh, poets in this country whom they might particularly like. Um, they say many of them were raised to feel it was an ancient art they could never aspire to. Um, young writers in Gaza have been reaching out through the internet. I think we have a particular obligation to read them and to think about them. Uh, there was an amazing poem recently on the electronic intifada, which has started publishing a little more poetry. Um, since Jimmy Carter has been one of the only American politicians ever to acknowledge the existence of Palestinian people in a rounded way, I feel that we have a real obligation to read all these young voices. Um, recently doing a Skype session with writers and teachers and translators in Baghdad, um, I was asking them what had sustained them through these many recent terrible years, and quite a few of them said the voices of Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman had been foremost. They were all doing new translations of both these poets. Uh, they, were, they would have just spent the entire time talking with one another about their own translations. Um, it seemed like an incredibly generous move on their parts to me to be so interested in American poets at all. Uh, and you made the comment that translation is sometimes a delayed action. I'd like to thank Inga Judd in this audience. I met her here last year, and we had a good conversation. And already, some of her translations, thank you very much, um, of a couple of my humble poems have appeared in a beautiful German magazine. And I've visited Germany many times, but next time, I'm taking this with me. Thank you, Inga. Uh, thank you for your work. And the crucial need, I feel, for international literature that's not particularly written for children to be shared with young children as well. Um, this is something that American teachers are very, very open to. Uh, and I wanted just to quote from uh, an essay written by Daria Donnelly, who lived in Cambridge. She was a critic, especially wrote about children's lit. She taught at Boston U. And uh, she said, Always as international troubles surround us and mount, it becomes clear that our children will be inheriting a confusing, conflict-sundered world, one that needs them to be empathetic and engaged. But impediments to cultivating empathy abound. And she talks about that. She goes on, how can we recover children's innate capacity for empathy? Literature is one of the best ways. It promises both contact and imaginative identification and sympathy. And since, as Americans, we sometimes seem to be suffering from a deficit in both of those, um, I will write, and then she goes into a long essay about books that help us overcome those deficits. Um, 
Her piece is called Studies Abroad. Her name was Daria Donnelly. And she suggested simply to everyone, parents, teachers, young, uh, young people, readers, she said, look for books and voices from other countries you're interested in. Choose books in which Americans play no prominent role, or if they do, are neither saviors nor demons, but rather the usual mix of venial and kind. Third, and for me very important, try to find some books that are oases of calm and beauty, whatever their subject. Seek out stories that follow a character for years rather than days. The most radical change in American childhood has been the amount of inf information available to today's children and the rapidity with which they are expected to absorb it. Where is the time to think and dream? Books and poems take the longer view. Their pace is compatible with reflection. So you can find the whole essay, which I really urge you to read. It was originally published in Commonweal um, about literature of empathy. And um, just a couple of years ago, um, we're, we'd like to have a conversation with you all if, if you have some time or questions or answers. A couple of years ago, I was asked by um, um, a very kind person in Finland to um, overnight send her the names of my favorite seven writers from Helsinki whom I would like to invite to a dinner with the first lady of the country. <laughs> and I was so ashamed, once again. Yes, they and do that all the time. I know. They're these big people, they just ask you for something for, like that. And it has to be overnight. <laughs> so I had a panic attack. I started scouring my bookshelves. Everything was on the floor. And then I went to the internet, and I'm not a particularly savvy tech user, but there are an astounding number of wonderful uh, sites of Finnish poets in translation. And in fact, I'm proud to say that I was able to find one that none of the poets or the first lady had ever heard of, one site. And by reading like 35 poets of Helsinki, it was easy to pick out seven that were my faves. And when they found out, um, you know, I turned in my list the next morning, exhausted and tired. <laughs> And um, when they were invited to dinner with the First Lady, of course, they all came. So it was very exciting. And at that meal, um, they were able to talk to her about her own work as a poet. She had been a poet and beautiful, beautiful person, Jenny Haukia. And uh, she, uh, we just had an exchange that really went on for days and um, continues till now. And I, I have to say that as a reluctant computer user, um, my spirits were really lifted about what you can find if you just keep going, keep searching, keep searching, keep searching. And uh, it was inspiring. And I think you can find, you know, if you want to find uh, people in hospitals in Galway, Ireland, what they're writing, you can find that. Um, and I should mention Galway, Ireland in another context. They have an international poems for patients with a CE on the end of it project where uh, all the patients in hospitals receive a little menu of poems on their tray when they get their meals. And every year that project is curated by a different uh, poet. And um, I had a chance this year to get a, a poem by a Chinese teenager on the hospital trays of Ireland. And that seemed like a very nice kind of exchange. She, um, she said she was, it was more than she could ever have dreamed to have her words beyond the hospital trays in all the hospitals. So uh, to continue sharing, to continue searching, to be curious. And here's a poem by Rira Abbasi of Iran, translated by Miriam Allah Amjadi. It was included in the most recent Poet Lore magazine from Washington, DC, in a longer section of her poems for her son, Esan, The Democracy of Sparrows. Those very sparrows who have impishly encircled the capital, who have come from heights a thousand times and fallen to fly. Those very sparrows from the fields of wheat with the singular wings of childhood are the ones who sit low on every step and patio, the ones who are mosque sitters in every house, every tavern. See. These very sparrows who have concluded a celebration of voices from one conversation to another. They have become the text of democracy in the life of this small yard. Do you hear 
from one sound to another. Sparrows are published. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great. I want to... Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I want to very quickly uh, put in a plug for two great websites. One is the Poetry Translation Center at SOAS, England, the School of Oriental and African Studies, that old colonial project. And they have a great poetry translation center. Uh, so look them up. Uh, I will read very two short poems on them. There's also a great poetry festival in Rotterdam. Uh, it's called Poetry International. The, I think it's been on for 50 years now. They have an excellent collection of, uh, of poems. I want to read two poems. One is from the, the Dutch website. Um, by a, and this, but because this is the shortest poem. By, and these are two poems that I've become excited about. They, Piedad Bonnet or Bonnet. I think in Spanish it would be Bonnet. It's, this is prayer. For my days I ask, Lord of shipwrecks, not for water for my thirst, but thirst. Not for dreams, but for the desire to dream. For the nights or the darkness that will be needed to drown my own darkness. Short poem. And this is a great Indian poem, Gagan Gil, Every Love, very dramatic poem. When it arrives on your doorstep, the first thing every love asks is, can you jump from the window for me? Can you stab your heart for me? Every love asks this, can you fly with me with only the stumps of your arms? When love arrives on your doorstep, it will not leave you soon. It has to go up to some mountain or valley, to an ocean or river. It comes to your house out of the blue and wants to know if you will come along to drown with it or not. Every love gives you enough time to die for it. <laughs>